Hello and welcome to Carmichael Clan Radio, the official podcast of Clan Carmichael USA. I'm your host, Scott Carmichael. On today's show, Eagle Gate editor Leah Carmichael Hargrove speaks with university professor Dr. Donald William Stewart from the University of Highlands and Islands on the Isle of Skye, where they discuss Alexander Carmichael. As you'll hear, Alexander was born on the island of Lismore and is best known for traveling throughout the Scottish Highlands, recording information on local folklore and traditions, material objects, and the observations on the natural history throughout the Scottish Highlands. Before we get started, I want to encourage you all to visit Clan Carmichael USA's website at www.clancarmichaelusa.com to learn more about how to get involved in Clan Carmichael USA. We're quickly approaching 2023, and Clan Carmichael USA has some really big things coming up next year. I hope you'll consider joining and becoming a member if you haven't already, and might also consider making a tax-deductible charitable contribution to the Clan Carmichael Scholarship Fund or the Clan Carmichael Restoration Fund. Be on the lookout for ways to donate to be up on the website soon. For those of you who have already joined or donated, we can't thank you enough. You allow our organization to continue growing and to continue to offer more to Carmichaels across the U.S. and Canada. One new way that you can also help Clan Carmichael is by using Amazon Smile when you buy anything on Amazon. Amazon Smile donates a portion of sales to charitable organizations like Clan Carmichael USA. You can log into your Amazon account at smile.amazon.com and select Clan Carmichael USA as your nonprofit of choice. From there, Amazon will donate a small portion of each purchase you make toward Clan Carmichael USA. It's a really easy way to make contributions while you shop on Amazon. And before we get started, I also want to tell you about a recent experience of my own. I recently attended my first Highland Games, the Stone Mountain Highland Games in Stone Mountain, Georgia. And I have to say, it was great fun. I want to encourage each of you to try to find a local Highland Games near you to attend. I think that you'll see, as I did, that they're actually quite fun, and that the community is friendly and equally proud of their Scottish heritage. I hope to see you at an event soon. Again, visit www.clancarmichaelusa.com to learn more about how to become a member. And now, let's get started with the show. Fiskerma. Fiskerma, Fiskerma, Magadili. Great. Yeah, perfect. (laughs) Thank you for your patience, too. There's always something with technology. Okay, um, I might have to, I might play it safe and turn the video off uh, because uh, Wi-Fi comes and goes. Yes, that would actually save on my battery life as well. So I, I, you know, I was thinking, I was feeling sorry because it was so late there, but then I realized, I don't, do you even have nighttime at the moment? Uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, the sun hasn't set, if that's what you mean. Uh, yes. it's still bright yeah it's still bright out here and it will be it will be for yeah like you say for most of the night uh there'll be there'll be some you know s- some light going on yeah well further up north where i'm from 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 the end of lewis i mean there's always this band of sunlight uh in the far north uh in the in the you know in the middle of summer and uh, yeah it just is always bright that's wild. I've, I've been, to, I've never been to the Hebrides, but I was in the Orkneys around this time, almost 10 years ago. And I remember being outside at one in the morning and it, you yeah. could have read a magazine. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. I, we feel spoiled here. So my family are, are transplants to North Dakota, which for the United States is pretty far north. Wow, that, that is far north. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I looked at a map right before I called you. I think we're 45 degrees north. and. You're easily another 15. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it feels north to you, but it's, uh, yeah, just as the far south. <laughs> no, and, and somehow you still manage to have much better weather than we do, which I find oh. deeply unfair. <laughs> Not so far this summer. It's been a bit rough. Yeah. Well, fun. Well, um, I should 
I should let you know, even though I emailed you, I just want to make sure I've been clear that I would like to record this just so that I don't have to be yeah, having yeah, half a brain. Perfect. Okay, good. I always want to make sure people are comfortable with that. Of course. Um, yeah. yeah. And I personally am really excited about this interview because um, I do a lot for Clay and Carmichael and write a lot of stories, but I myself have become really interested in, in Celtic Christian traditions. Um, began sort of, I guess, with its cousin. I've read a lot of Julian of Norwich during the pandemic. Yes. Yeah, yes. and then sort of naturally migrated west. Um, so yeah, I, I find the uh, Alexander's story and his work fascinating. And I'm, I'm really excited to introduce the rest of my clansmen to it because a lot of Americans are not familiar with him at all, even within Clay and Carmichael, which is too bad. Sure, um, sure. Yeah. So first, if, if you don't mind, Dr. Stewart, if you would introduce yourself and where you're from and how you got into your current field, we'd like to know a little bit about who you are and why this is important to you. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. William Stewart, Donald William Stewart in English. I'm uh, from Scotland. I was brought up on the island of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides. So that's where my father uh, was born and uh, we went back there I went to the the school there then uh, I did classics as my first degree I did Latin and Greek as my first degree at university but then after that I thought well I should do a if I'm going to do a PhD if I'm going to carry on in university I think it would be quite useful and quite interesting and quite worthwhile for me to study my own culture and my family's culture which is Scottish Gaelic mm -hmm. uh, the language spoken in the Scottish Highlands and uh, so I went to Edinburgh University to the School of Scottish Studies which is a sort of folklore institute at Edinburgh University and to the Celtic department there and I did a PhD on the Highlands the Scottish Highlands in the 1600s and I was looking at folklore and I was looking at history, and I was looking at literature as well, and trying to get a hand on what people were feeling and thinking, as well as about the history of the region in itself. Now, I did that, I did a PhD, and then I did, uh, I was doing lecturing at Edinburgh, but I was also uh, I was also doing theatre. We, uh, myself mm -hmm. and two friends, we we did a, a bilingual theatre and education group. Uh, so we'd go around the Highlands, especially. We'd be visiting primary schools and doing plays in English and in Gaelic uh, about the history of the Highlands. And uh, this is great because it, you know it was, it was fun job. It was difficult. It was hard. It was very tiring, mm -hmm. but it was great. It was great fun to do. And it also gave all three of us an insight into all parts of the Highlands. I mean, we visited, uh, I think we visited every island in the Hebrides where there was a, a primary school and we visited all the mainland, uh, most of the mainland primary schools as well. So we got an insight into the community and into the landscape of the different places and we got a chance to talk uh, very often to the, the you know the last of the old timers in all mm. these places as well maybe record them as well so it was, it was quite a privilege as well to be going around the highlands at that time uh i was also doing a bit of work in uh, in television i was doing acting and i was doing presenting as well so uh, you know again it was it, it was more than just it was more than just uh, uh, doing academic work and it, it had an influence on the academic work which i do because I, you know i like telling stories i like trying to uh, speak to a, as wide an audience as possible i suppose you could say and that has uh, you know it's very much informed what i've been writing about and uh, how i've been writing about it over the past 20 years. Now, the, the big Carmichael break was, uh, as I said, I was at the University of Edinburgh and Alexander Carmichael's papers, his archive, is at the University of Edinburgh. And, uh, you know, we sort of everybody knew it was there, but there were problems with it, various problems, which we, we can talk about later. Uh, one of the biggest problems was that it was just a great mass of paper. And also Alexander Carmichael's handwriting was very, very difficult to read. And, and people didn't really know where to start. 
uh, you know, if you're trying to sort of interrogate the archive and make sense of it and see what uh, Carmichael was, uh, you know, writing about and find out about his, his experiences uh, collecting Gaelic folklore uh, between, you know, the 1860s and his death in 1912. Uh, but I, I thought that I should... I should go and have a look at some of this stuff. So I, I, I did, and it was very, very difficult to read uh, indeed, because Carmichael, when reading especially the papers which he used when he was recording face-to-face, -face, he was writing down stories and songs and anecdotes from people. Uh, he'd be writing in pencil, and he'd be writing very, very fast, trying to keep up to the with the dictation. Uh, so, you know, his, his handwriting was absolutely dreadful. Uh, but I, I could sort of, you know, if you stared at it long enough, you could start to make sense of a bit of it. Uh, and then I guess I had a sort of lucky break because one of my teachers at uh, the Celtic Department of the University of Edinburgh. He too was fascinated by uh, Carmichael. Uh, that is Donald Meek from the island of Tyree, Professor Donald Meek, who has written a very important book on Celtic Christianity called The Quest for Celtic Christianity. It's a wonderful book. It's well worth reading. Again, he's trying to uh, appeal to and speak to as wide an audience as possible. It's not at all dry. It's very, very humorous, very light touch. But at the same time, it's informed by a very, very deep learning. And he was interested in Carmichael, and he was having the same sort of problems as I was having uh, in trying to make sense of this collection. So he arranged that I would get a grant from the Carnegie Trust, that's the University Trust in Scotland, to work in these papers for a year, just to go through them all, uh, try to make sense of the collection, try to make sense of how the collection had been put together, and also try to make sense of what exactly was in the collection. And behind everything else, there's a question of how to find Carmichael's lost field notes that is the uh, material which he had used, uh, the material, uh, you know, the papers which he had actually recorded material from uh, people when he was out collecting folklore uh, for 50, 60 years of his life. So that was, uh, I guess, where I first started working on Carmichael's papers, uh, you know, methodically and systematically. But I think maybe we should go back and actually talk about who Alexander Carmichael was. Yeah. Well, before yeah. we start rushing on about, about talking about his papers. Still, they're all fascinating. And that, that's such a privileged and I would think adventurous field of study. I'm quite envious. I would have loved to spend that time traveling around Scotland, but also to get into those papers. Um, you know, and actually, before you even get into to Carmichael, it might be helpful um, as a Scot, if you could give us a little bit of a picture of what the world he was born into in 1832 looked like. I know he was born in Lismore um, and a lot of American Carmichaels are descended from um, mm. Lismore immigrants. Um, but, but what was it like being a Highlander and, and an Islander at that time? Well, it's, it's a very it's a very interesting question. Lismore is a beautiful island. It's uh, very, very green. It's very fertile. Uh, I've read, uh, I've heard that there isn't a one one sprig of heather between one end of the island and the other. It's all it's all good pasture. Uh, it's near the town of Oban. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to get to it nowadays. Uh, it's a long, thin island and it is not out in the sea by any means it's in a sea loch or a sea fjord i, I suppose you could call it called loch linney uh and uh, i don't exactly know the the number of people who'd be living on it when carmichael was around i'm going to stick my neck out and say maybe there was about 500 there may well have been more uh there are substantially fewer nowadays Carmichael, looking back on his childhood from later in life, saw his early years as being 
living in a sort of nostalgic paradise, if you like, because there were two particularly awful things which happened in the island when, uh, or around the island, when Carmichael was young. The first was that the island was bought by an accountant called George Cheney, who uh, took upon himself to clear the southern half of the island of its tenants and that caused as you can imagine a huge uproar and there was uh, you know the, the, the certainly are reports of people uh not saying rioting but certainly uh certainly uh, being t- disapproving and causing ructions about being evicted and you know if we think about carmichael during this period you know he he lost perhaps half of his school friends just in this one major clearance and and maybe some of the people living uh, listening to this uh, podcast just now they, they're descendants of uh, people who had to leave Lismore uh, during this major clearance uh, the other uh, major event which took place a few years later in Lismore was uh, and, and across the whole of the western highlands of course was the great potato famine uh, which wasn't as lethal as it was in Ireland, but nevertheless caused a huge amount of famine, uh, many deaths and uh, a lot of emigration again. And this is, again, Carmichael would have been uh, in his early teens when the great potato famine struck the highlands. So. Looking back on his early life, Carmichael, like many other people of his age, would have been looking back across, you know, very, very difficult and painful years of adolescence. Uh, Time, as I've said, of famine, time of clearance and eviction. And I think this, if you like, informed the sort of way in which he looked upon the Highlands before the, the, the 1840s, before the famine, before the, these major clearances that took place before and after the famine, as being this sort of lost paradise, if you like. Uh, and his, his picture of that was, was shaped very much by nostalgia, which we can see coming out in the later articles and books which he wrote about the culture and the people of the highlands. Uh, I guess the other thing which I should say is uh, that Carmichael, even though he he went to school in Lismore, of course, but he went to academy or high school in a town called Greenock, which is near Glasgow on the Firth of Clyde. It's a a shipbuilding and industrial town. And again, uh, you know, we can imagine the young Carmichael being taken from this this lovely fertile island of Lismore and, uh, you know, finding himself in this, uh, you know, very, very difficult uh, industrial town. Uh, His poverty was rife, uh, very dirty, very noisy, uh, you know, not, nothing green growing uh, where he would have been. And uh, again, I think that move from the highlands, from the, the, the sort of the, what would you say, the, 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 the island where he was brought up into a dirty, noisy, poverty-stricken industrial town uh, in his later adolescence, again, very much informed the way that he looked upon the highlands. That would have been deeply formative, I'm sure. And I wonder how much of his schooling would have been in Gaelic? Any of it? All of it? Oh, the, the, that's a very, very good question. Again, his first, his primary school, if you like, the early years would have been, I am sure, spent in a Gaelic school. When we look even at uh, the earliest papers that Carmichael was writing, in his early 20s. I mean, to me, it's clear that he was much more fluent in uh, Gaelic than he was in English. 
uh, that would change later on with as he as he as he grew older as he spent more time among uh, English speaking people and especially in his final years in Edinburgh. But uh, at the start of his career, uh, he was uh, he was very much, I think, a, a, a Gaelic speaker. He thought in Gaelic. He wrote in Gaelic, uh, and he was, uh, I think, much more fluent and comfortable in Gaelic than he was in English. Okay, which of course is a major strength for him later during his writing. Um, Absolutely, but- Absolutely, yes. I mean, he knew the language inside out. Uh, And he didn't just know, you know, one dialect of the language. He knew many, many different dialects of Gaelic from the time that he, uh, you know, from the the, the time he was collecting all over the highlands. He knew the language inside out. And uh, this this made him such a really extraordinary scholar of the language and its literature and its people, indeed, later on in his life. Now I wish I had several hours just to ask about all the different dialects. It's so interesting. Yes. But, let, let me ask this question about Gaelic. Um, I know, let's see. I, will talk about, I know we'll talk about this later, that sort of the wider Protestant Scotland was not particularly friendly towards some of the Celtic traditions that he was gathering. How, how friendly was the wider community or the wider um, British Isles towards Gaelic speaking? Oh, it's, yeah, again, it's, it's a difficult question to answer uh, because you had different types of Gaelic speakers, as you say. Uh, first and foremost, you had the split between the Gaelic or Gaelic speakers in Ireland, who are mainly Protestant, and uh, I guess were viewed with uh, some suspicion uh by uh, English speakers in Great Britain. And then also you have Scottish Gaelic speakers who, again, you know, they're almost between the two, if you like. They're mainly Protestant. And yet at the same time, I think there was certainly residual suspicion, uh, which occasionally blossomed into outright contempt uh, among some English speakers at any rate, both in Scotland and in England, uh, against Scottish Gaels. They were seen as as being lazy, they were seen as being backwards, and, uh, you know, ironically, uh, there are many people who are thinking, well, the best thing that could be done with these people is that they, uh, you know, the sort of slightly useless section of population, uh, they should be sent abroad, they should be sent uh, into the empire as settlers, and they, they, they can learn. <laughs> the Americans will take them. <laughs> <laughs> the Americans, well, not, not so much the Americans, but more the Canadians, the Australians and New Zealanders mm. uh, can take them and uh, and uh, shape them shape them up if you like. So there there was certainly this uh, residual, uh, undoubtedly, especially you can see it coming through very strongly in the newspapers uh, uh, at the time. You know the the, the, the famine. Uh, many people were saying, as they said in Ireland, of course, this is uh, caused by uh, the fecklessness of the Gales. They're getting what they deserved uh, because they're not working hard enough. They're lazy. Uh, therefore, the best thing that we can do with them and to prevent any famine happening in the future is to uh, pack them off in ships across to uh, Canada or to Australia, which is where many thousands of them uh, ended up uh, as a result. So Carmichael, you know, Carmichael, one you know, very, very important part of Carmichael, if you like, his public facing uh, uh, English language work was to try to work as a sort of a PR man, a public relations man for the Scottish Gales and, uh, you know, to, if you like, remake their image and their identity as being these sort of spiritual, refined population uh, living close to nature. The ideal, if you like, of Celtic Christianity uh, rather than the sort of dirty, lazy, uh, feckless, backward people uh, that, uh, you know, was a very strong stereotype uh, among uh, English speakers at the time. Sure. Um, and if, honestly, if, if we were, had Alexander here to speak with him today, would that even be like the name that he would respond to? In lots of places I've seen him listed as Alistair McGilly Michael, and I've read a little bit about how many McGilly Michaels anglicized their names. Um, was was that to prevent some like prejudice when they went out and about, or is that common? Oh, that's a long, long story. Uh, he is a Mach Gilly Michael. 
Mark Edomico. Oh, thank the, the, you. That's yeah, beautiful. That's, that's, that's a Gaelic. He is the son of the servant of, of Michael. Michael. Right? Uh, that is the archangel, the archangel Michael. Uh, and there definitely was connection to the bishops of Lismore. Lismore had the cathedral and the Carmichaels were supposedly, in fact, I'm sure they were connected with the uh, bishops of Lismore. Now, if we look at Carmichael, if we look at uh, Carmichael's life, uh, especially when he was putting together his great work, Carmen and Gadelica, the collection of uh, prayers, blessings, hymns, charms, incantations, which made his name and uh, through which he is still remembered today, uh, we can see that he was very much emphasizing the importance of St. Michael, uh, his, his own patron saint in uh Carmen and Gadelica, and indeed when he was handing in the final proofs in Edinburgh in 1899, the year before it was actually printed, he made sure that he took the train from his Highland cottage in Teanal near, uh, near Oban. He went down on St. Michael's Day, 29th of September, to Edinburgh deliberately so that he would, if you like, send in the final proofs on the day of his patron saint. It was almost being dedicated, if you like, to uh, St. Michael. So uh, St. Michael and uh, the traditions and beliefs connected with St. Michael meant a great deal to Alistair Mac to Alexander Carmichael. Uh, uh, they, they, they certainly did, especially towards, I think, towards the end of his life, as he did more research and learned more about the importance of uh, of Michaelmas, of the festival of St. Michael's Day, 29th of September, in the Western Highlands, uh, you know, in the, the very old days, you know, uh, maybe, uh, you know, up to, uh, almost up to his own lifetime, but not quite. It was within living memory that there would be great big celebrations of St. Michael's Day. Uh, there would be horse racing on the uh, on the strands, on the beaches uh, in the Outer Hebrides. Uh, there would be processions. There would be feasting, banqueting. There would be uh, big parties, uh, parties all night going on uh, because of uh, on St. Michael's Day. And Carmichael made a point in recording uh, these memories and uh, the hymns and uh, beliefs that were connected with it. I'm, I'm curious to see the St. Michael connection in Lismore because, well, um, Clan Carmichael is based out of Lowland Scotland, I think. And um, what I've heard from our current Chief Richard is that our name also pays homage to St. Michael. Mm -hmm. um, there's perhaps a fort or a church on top of a hill in the area from which we got our name. So that's really interesting. So St. Michael clearly plays a big role for many of our Carmichael ancestors. Um, I, I want to now get in a little bit to the um, Carmina Gadalica, but I was wondering if, if first, because it's probably new for a lot of Carmichaels, if you would, if you would mind giving your elevator speech about what it is, and then we can talk about how it, how it was yeah. born. <laughs> Let's talk about cut very quickly. Carmichael uh, what became an excise man. That is, he was charged, he was given an official position to try to hunt out illicit whiskey, uh, whiskey distilling, and stop that going on. Uh, and also to be in charge, if you like, of uh, making sure that uh, legal whiskey distillers paid their taxes. He, uh, if you like, begins he, his, uh, his Highland career at any rate in the end of Isla in 1860, uh, where he comes under the influence of a man called John Francis Campbell, whose father used to own the island of Isla, or most of the island of Isla, before he went bankrupt. Uh, John Francis Campbell is very well known in folklore circles today as a pioneer story collector. Uh, his four volumes, Popular Tales of the West Highlands, published between 1860 and 1862, uh, are still read today. They're still important texts. Now, Carmichael started collecting in the island of Isla for John Francis Campbell. He collected long stories and he also collected um, heroic uh, tales and heroic ballads for him. 
then he uh, he got a post in Sky and he did the same thing. He was collecting these long stories. He was collecting the heroic tales. Uh, but finally, in 1864, at the very end of 1864, he deliberately asked that he be given an excise post in the islands of Uist and Barra in the Outer Hebrides, because he believed with justice that these were the richest areas for folklore in the Scottish Highlands. Uh, to, as you alluded to earlier, uh, the islands of South Uist and Barra are Catholic, and again, with justice, Carmichael believed that beliefs and uh, a lot of folklore, basically, would be easier to collect in Catholic areas where these beliefs are more on the surface, rather than in Protestant evangelical areas where, uh, you know, sizable section of the population disapproved of people telling lying stories and, uh, you know, reciting charms and incantations and stuff like that. That was superstition. And uh, there were many ministers and elders of the church who were trying to stamp that out at the time. So Carmichael thought, well, I'll go to the, 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 the Catholic areas and I'll get stuff there. And that is indeed what happened. He uh, spent, as I said, he spent between 1864 and uh, say about 1882 or so collecting basically everything from long stories to uh, songs to riddles and proverbs to unusual words to place names to archaeological information to history uh, he was a, an obsessed man now the thing about working as an exciseman was that his job was to go around different communities uh tried to looking for uh, looking for illegal whiskey and indeed collecting taxes now you wouldn't have thought that carmichael would have been a particularly welcome uh, visitor to various communities but no he, that's he, the he, first he, thing i thought he didn't seem very popular <laughs> He had, a, he had a good uh, he had a good way about him. He had a, he had a good character. Uh, people respected him. He uh, was known, we know, to turn a blind eye to uh, certain, uh, you know, distilling and maybe getting rum or whiskey from shipwrecks and the like. He he would ignore that and try to keep you know, on good terms with the people themselves. Uh, you know, he, he, he was, you know, he was, uh, he still appears today. As, in some ways, he's a bit of a figure of fun, but he was also, he's clearly respected by the people too. Uh, he, he also, you know, he lived among the people. Uh, he married Mary Frances McBean from uh, the Black Isle, from the Eastern Highlands in 1868. Uh, they had a family of four children and he brought up the children in US. So they knew Carmichael as a family man. Uh, his wife was very heavily involved in uh, the charity movement. That is, she would... Uh, arrange for the, 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 the poorest members of island society to be given charity in return for weaving and knitting uh, and the, the material, the blankets and the, the tweeds which they, they wove would be sold in charity bazaars in the lowlands of Scotland and in England. Uh, and uh, that would be a way of them getting money. So Carmichael was able to make contact uh, with the poorest people in community, and quite often these poorest people had the best stories, they had the best folklore. And because he was an excise man, he was able to move from community to community. He would know everybody in the community. And as a result, he was able to find and the best people uh, who, who, had, uh, who had lore, who had stories, who had songs, uh, in, in these different villages and record them. He also knew the landscape. He had to, he had to understand, uh, you know, partially because he was looking for uh, illegal uh, whiskey distilling, uh, looking for the stills. He had to know the island, the, the islands like the back of the back of his hands. And because he knew the landscape, he knew the place names. Uh, it was easier for him to understand the lower 
of the people because so much of the lore is actually embedded in the landscape. It's about different landmarks. Uh, is about events which happened in the local landscape. And because he knew the landscape, he could understand, uh, you know, what the what the folklore is about and he could... Uh, he could... Uh, um, he he could ask better questions about it. He could show the people that he understood and that he appreciated their lore. And uh, as a result, they were more willing to spend time with him and give him uh, give him more stuff. So I think the elevator has probably reached about the 200 floor <laughs> already. But that that is, I feel I should uh, I should give Carmichael's, uh, you know, what, why Carmichael was such a good collector. And it's to do with his personality. Uh, it's to do with his looks, we have to say, as well. As he's a handsome man. He'd, he'd always wear the kilt. He was a strong man as well. I mean, he wasn't a, a you know, sort of wimpy folklore collector by any means. He had to be out there. Uh, he had to, you know, this is before roads, before bridges. Uh, you know, he'd be crossing streams. He'd be fording rivers. He'd be uh, even fording uh, straits. Uh, of the sea, he'd be walking through the heather across the moorland to different places. It wasn't an easy life by any means, uh, but he was he he was strong enough to be able to uh, to do this in you know very challenging conditions. And I have to say, I'm pretty jealous of him. I think I can understand <laughs> when you said he was an obsessed man. I'm sure everything that he caught felt like a jewel that really might not have lasted much longer. Um, no, he, he's uh, a lot of the stuff he had from people who were reco- who, who were born, I should say, during the 1700s. And that takes us back a long, long way. And as I've said, it's also people that remembered what the old way of Highland life was like before the clearances, before the, the, the great Highland famine. Uh, and they, they, they were a, a different, I mean, Carmichael himself thought they were a different breed of people. Mm. Uh, they were much, uh, you know, you could say even before English schooling came in as well, uh, they knew the stories, they knew the songs, that was how they entertained each other, uh, and they, they had wonderful memories as well. I remember reading in some of my research that it was not uncommon for people to seek him out, like, during the night to tell him things in secret. Is it is that true? Or is that just a, is that folklore itself? It's possibly true that there's folklore about Alexander Carmichael itself, and some of this folklore comes from Carmichael because you know, and and, and Carmichael's circle as well. After Carmichael retired from Uist, he went to Edinburgh, where he had a much easier life. Uh, he was uh, supervising just one distillery in Edinburgh, and instead of travelling around the Hebrides, he just basically had to walk. Um, up the road from his house to this distillery every day and, uh, you know, much easier life. And he had much more time uh, to deal with this uh, huge amount of paper, which he had amassed over the, you know, the previous 20, 30 years. Uh, So uh, because of that, uh, he, you know, he had time. Also, his family were growing up, so he no longer had time to, you know, no longer had to 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 look after his family uh, so much. He he was able to sit down and uh, look through his papers, and it is clear that you know he had friends helping him to do this, and he became this sort of guru figure, this sort of Celtic guru figure, uh, especially in the eighteen nineties. Uh, he uh, you know, he, he became what a lot of people wanted him to be, this sort of representative of the old society, of the old ways. Uh, and he was clearly full of stories. He was full of anecdotes <laughs> himself. And I'm sure a lot of these stories would have grown with the telling. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the secrecy, that, that's a big question about a lot of the stuff which appears in Carmen and Cadelica, that is the blessings, the prayers, the charms, which Carmichael had recorded. Some of them must have been given to Carmichael in terms of secrecy, especially the incantations and the charms, the healing charms, especially, which he had been given. 
uh, it's clear that, you know, people weren't supposed to recite these out loud, both for fear of disapproval by the local minister, maybe, or the local priest, but also because some people believe that, uh, you know, if, the, if the, the secret was divulged, if you like, that the charm would lose its potency, that it would lose its power. So uh, Carmichael had to be quite careful about that. And we can see in Carmen Gadelica, sometimes he, he doesn't ascribe the charm to the person that we knew gave it to him in the first place. And mm. I do wonder, you know, maybe he had promised the person who, from whom he had been given the charm in the first place. You know, he promised, I, 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 I promise not to, not to let this, the cat out of the bag to other people. Uh, but he did later on. He was trying, if you like, to uh, to make make the best of a bad job, uh, and uh, and get the stuff out there, get the stuff preserved, uh, and at the same time to to try to keep his promise, maybe that he had made earlier mm. on. It's. I have to tell you that it's been really interesting for me. Uh, my family is Presbyterian, so we feel strong to our yes, Scottish so heritage. Yeah, yeah. So, and of course, the Presbyterian Church is very intellectual and dry. Um, I don't know if they call you this in Scotland, but over here we're called the Frozen Chosen. Oh no, I didn't <laughs> <Yeah>. know that. <laughs> we're the Frozen Chosen. Um, I yeah. remember being small and uh, we didn't even clap in church. You know, like small children oh, would go no. up and sing. There, yeah, no clap. Yeah, very dry. So when I, um, for my family, my my paternal, let's see, my paternal grandmother, her family were Watsons, and they were even more Scottish, really, and and very anti papal is what they would say. And, yeah, like, yeah. You know, viewed Catholics as very superstitious and idolaters. And um, so the first time I came across these Celtic prayers, it, it seemed dangerously close to paganism. You know, it's a yeah. Yeah. very, very nature focused. Um, but yes. the more time I've spent in them, and of course, with the work of, um, oh, I've totally forgotten, um, McDonald, the, the man who sort of uh, restarted Iona in the past century. Oh, yeah. So the, the McLeod. McLeod, <laughs> McLeod, thank you. <laughs> Yes, not even close. McLeod. Um, those things, they've helped me a lot to understand yes. the beauty of Celtic spiritual and also sort of add some more, I guess, wetness back to a very dry faith. Um, so, so tell me a little bit about then what is in the work you gathered, the Carmina Gadalica. You, you talked about blessings and prayers. And some of these things would be very foreign, I think, for evangelical Christians today, um, particularly on our side of the Atlantic. It is. I think, uh, I, I mean, again, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole. It's another 200 floor elevator pitch. But uh, mm. at the time, the, the end of the 1800s, um, the uh, Free Church of Scotland, which was the main Presbyterian church in the Highlands, but also among the middle classes in the lowland towns and cities, was really undergoing a huge period of turmoil. And part of the problem, I think, was that um, Highland, uh, Highland congregations especially uh, were cleaving ever more firmly to what you were talking about, very sort of Sabbatarian and quite austere view of Christianity. Uh, but there were other alternative pictures of Highland Christianity available. And when Carmichael was putting Carmen and Gadelica together, this collection of hymns and blessings and prayers, he was trying to show to a wider audience that there was more to Highland Christianity than the stereotype, which was becoming prevalent at that period of, as I said, you know, a very, very cold, very austere, uh, very sort of joyless and grim Christianity, evangelical Christianity. But if you look back in time, you could see that there was an alternative Christianity, which he traced back to St. Columba, the apostle of the Highlands, uh, in, you know, one and a half thousand years ago. And Carmichael's pitch was that the material which he had written down, the material which he was printing in Carmen Academica, offered 
another picture of Highland Christianity. In many ways, Carmen Gadelica can't be understood without paying attention to what was going on in the history of the Presbyterian churches of Scotland during this period uh, as well. I hope that makes sense. It does. Uh, yeah, makes a lot yeah. of sense. Now, I should really, I should emphasise too also, it's very, very important. I must get a mention in of Carmichael's wife here, of Mary Frances McBean. She was brought up not as a Presbyterian, but as an Episcopalian. And, you know, she was, she, she worked for and was related to Episcopalian bishops and priests who are very interested in liturgies. That mm-hmm. is, the prayers and blessings, uh, you know, traditional prayers and blessings of the church in centuries gone by. And I suspect, and I'm fairly sure, that the idea for Carmina Gadelica as a, a collection of prayers and blessings and charms uh, comes in the first place from Carmichael's wife. She knew that her husband was collecting this material. The death, you know, obviously they talk about it an awful lot. And I think she planted the seed in Carmichael's mind that what he was doing was actually unearthing a great traditional Highland liturgy, which had been preserved in the oral tradition of the Scottish Gaels for hundreds of years. And Carmichael, if you like, was gathering this together and printing it in Carmina Gadelica. And we should talk about what Carmina Gadelica looks like because it is a beautiful two-volume set of books. Uh, It is a luxury art book. Uh, It is printed on uh, sort of handmade paper, uh, or at least uh, the first edition was. It is uh, illustrated by illuminated Celtic letters drawn by uh, Mary Frances Carmichael with the help of her daughter, Ella. It is deliberately meant to remind its readers of old Celtic manuscripts. Uh, It's as much a book of art, a work of art, as it is a collection of texts. And it's probably one of the most important Scottish art books ever published. Uh, Very, very expensive, far too expensive for the crofters in the islands who actually gave Carmichael the material in the first place. And that is possibly a problem in the sense that, you, you know, it never had the effect that Carmichael was wanting, both politically mm. and religious, religiously, uh, because it was such, you know, it's three guineas. Uh, it's very, very expensive uh, at the time. And uh, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was uh, aimed at a, a, a sort of a, an audience for interest in art books. Mm. That's it's too bad to hear that it it wasn't as useful to the people he was gathering from during his lifetime. Although I know we'll talk about this later, but it certainly has major import today and even outside of the scholarly realm. Um, I'm also happy to hear that it was as beautiful on the outside as it is in (laughs) the inside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't have the good fortune to be reading it in the original (laughs) Gaelic. Um, And and hopefully, if 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 you're feeling generous, you might read one for us in Gaelic so you can hear it. But but even in the English, it's beautiful. Right. Um, my my dad, right before I, I was just visiting my family's home in North Carolina this past month. And mm. on the way home, I told my dad about this interview. And he gave me one of those little pocket books of Celtic prayers sure. that Alexander gathered. Yeah. And, um, even this just little snippet. Um, you know, May the father take you in his fragrant clasp of love when you go across the flooding streams and the black river of death. They're all so beautiful. You know, they, they don't rhyme, yes. but there's a, not usually in English, but there's a, a, a meter to them in a, a repetition. And it, they're incredibly beautiful. Um, what are they like reading them in Gaelic? Did they rhyme? Did they did they follow a I've set a sort of poetry? Of the, <laughs> I've got a copy <laughs> of the original edition in front of me here. So this is the first one. This is Ram Rawoni, the rune before prayer. Uh, uh, and, and what begins, is a rune? 
a rune, sorry, a rune is, uh, well, it's what Carmichael called a round. In other words, it is a verse, yeah. but it's sort of a holy verse. Uh, so, have you lobuch malone, a soul and a hara cruish me, a soul of ich gehanish me, a soul of spirit, a glanish me, le cars a yes cave. Train hen unge fein a ye, taber gain, taber na chain, girl che, grach che. Gatje, Gashje, Grasje, Skatje is Tulje. Yanu Talon and Re, Mata Eilish's name, Vicha Toyer Nev, Gatur Agis Seiche, Gatwa Agis Eiche, Gatuad Aunagave, Horge de Gre. Now, in English, that is, I am bending my knee in the eye of the Father who created me, in the eye of the Son who purchased me, in the eye of the Spirit who cleansed me, in friendship and affection. Through thine own anointed one, O God, bestow upon us fullness in our need, love toward God, the affection of God, the smile of God, the wisdom of God, the grace of God, the fear of God, and the will of God to do on the world of the three as angels and saints do in heaven, each shade and light, each day and night, each time and kindness, give thou us thy spirit. So that's the first, the opening round rock mm. uh, in Carmichael, yes. And that would have been said before a prayer. I said before a prayer, yes. He's, mm. got, a, he's got a wee bit at the beginning where he talks about how old people in the aisles sing this or some other short hymn before prayer. Sometimes the hymn and the prayer are intoned in low, tremulous, unmeasured cadences, like the moving and moaning, the sawing and the sighing of the ever-murmuring sea on their own wild shores. So that's... Uh, that's it's current. beautiful. Yeah, he's... he's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the one to begin. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good beginning. It is a good uh, beginning. Um, are you many of the modern spirituality writers I've I've researched have said that the prayers that he's recorded would have been used regularly throughout the day marking the cycles and duties of the day as well as the cycles of the year um, which just seems really idyllic it seems utopian to think that um, that people of course you know this is pre-technology and pre-Facebook so maybe they did have this sort of time and presence of mind to mark the day in such a beautiful way but um, do, do you personally feel like that this was a big part of of the Highland people and the Gaelic people's everyday routines. I think I think we have to be careful here because I think that it it may well have been uh, part of just generally Highland life. Uh, if we're if we're looking, you know, before the the, the Reformation, even uh, it would be accepted that. You know, in, in 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 the Catholic Church, there are a whole series of prayers. Uh, you know, which you do when you get up in the morning, uh, when you uh, smear the fire at night, when you cover over the fire at night, when you go to bed. Uh, you know, when you uh, put the cattle out to graze in the morning, so they're safe. Uh, there's a whole series of blessings and, and hymns and prayers that people would use. And what we see, I think, in Carmichael is how that tradition is, if you like, it's embedded within uh, Highland culture and it's kept alive in Highland culture uh, up until Carmichael's day and long beyond that as well. You know, there are plenty of recordings uh, of, uh, of prayers and blessings uh, in the School of Scottish Studies, uh, recorded uh, almost up to the present day. Another thing I, I think that um, that really makes it stand out for me, that we've touched on a little bit, is is how many of these prayers and blessings are very focused on the nature of the surroundings of the people that live there, talking about the water, the sky. Um, and obviously these are people that either spent much time you know, at sea for their livelihood or herding, and were really familiar uh, with the illustrations that they're speaking about. Um, and that would be something that would be sort of different as well, I think, for maybe modern um, people people in mainstream religious traditions of Christianity. Um, do you think that was unique to the highlands around his time, or, or are people on the mainland also still deeply in touch with nature? 
I think I think uh, it was more obvious, perhaps, in the Highlands, possibly because uh, you know, particularly I should say, in Catholic areas, uh, it was a difficult life. It was a hard life. It was a life as an island famine uh, bears witness to. It was a life which was often precarious. Uh, and because of that, I think people felt, if you like, they had to they had to live in harmony with nature. People had to be much more aware of uh, of nature. And also, I think people would be more willing and um They'd be more willing to call upon spiritual aid, I think, uh, as well, uh, in a in a society that was, though in many ways rich in culture, it could be poor in terms of material things, uh, and as a result, people had this sort of panoply, if you like, of blessings, prayers and charms that they would draw upon to protect themselves and their families and their animals and to try to make sense of and to try to pull through what could be at times a very, very difficult environment uh, in which to live. Uh, the Healing charms, of course, many of them are connected with certain plants. And again, that means that the people, you know, they had to live close to nature, if you like. They had to be aware of, uh, you know, the, the, the different, uh, I don't know, the, 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 the different sort of powers of different plants, I, get, I guess, uh, which could help them. Uh, if they had fallen ill, and this was long before the days of the National Health Service or hospitals or doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, people really were thrown back upon their own resources and their own knowledge, uh, knowledge of the community, uh, and uh, also, uh, if you like, the, the supernatural world which surrounded them and which was very real to them as well. Mm. Do you have an example of one of those handy? I've, I'm not familiar with like the plant based blessings. And that's really curious to me not to put you um, on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's have a look. Oh, we've got the, let's see. We've got the yarrow here. Uh, the, the, Which I believe is good for wound care. Is that right? It or is. Yes, indeed it is. Yes. Um, here it is. Blani me and yarri. Now, I will pluck the yarrow fair that more benign shall be my face, that more warm shall be my lips, that more chaste shall be my speech. Be my speech the beams of the sun, be my lips the sap of the strawberry. May I be an isle in the sea, may, may I be a hill on the shore, may I be a star in the dark time, may I be a staff to the weak. Wound can I every man, wound can no man me. So there's an element there as well <laughs> of saying, you know, I can harm my enemies as well as no enemy. <laughs> It's always usually. helpful. <laughs> yeah, we have to remember that there's an there's an economy going on there, and uh, that some of the charms, at any rate, that Carmichael uh, it, perhaps inadvertently occasionally collected, were charms uh, not only to protect yourself but also to harm enemies, to harm people that would do you harm. That's part of this sort of supernatural economy uh, that's going on there. So that's a, that's a very interesting example uh, of. Uh, of the sort of, uh, you know, the sort of the, the, the double edged occasionally uh, part of these uh, of, of that tradition. But uh, as you can see, it's very much it's embedded in the landscape, in the plants which uh, which grow in uh, in in the in the Hebrides and uh, how these plants could be used uh with gestures and perhaps at certain times of the day in order to make these spells and incantations to protect people. Hmm. And I suppose he also captured those details as well. 
He did. He, he was uh, he was uh, careful. He was careful about that as well. Not not so much in Carmen and Gadelica, but uh, certainly in his field notebooks, uh, he can be quite detailed about you know the, the 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 entire performance, if you like, of the charms as well, because that's what they were. We're, we're in a way almost when we're talking about these healing charms. Uh, we're talking, okay, the plants have power in themselves, but they also have um, a sort of a placebo effect on the people that would be using them. Uh, it's very interesting that a lot of the, 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 the charms, you know, they're, they're against inflammation of some kind. And we know that inflammation uh, can be lessened in people uh, through placebo effects as well as through actual medicine. And it may well be that, uh, you know, the plants themselves may have had an effect, but also the, the sort of the dramatic effect of the performance of putting yourself in the <laughs> hands of somebody else, you know, the sort of very learned uh, uh, sort of plant doctor who would be able to, you know, take control of you and protect you from these supernatural powers and make you feel better, that that in itself... Uh, would have a beneficial effect on the person who is being charmed, who is being encanted over, and uh, we can see we can see that as well. But uh, you know, Carmichael is using this material to make the point that uh, you know Highlanders weren't living this weren't living this sort of sort of backward uh, primitive life, but uh, you know that there was in their in their tradition that there were. Um, there was poetry and there were beliefs of great beauty and great spirituality as well. Uh, and that, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, the, the, the sort of community ideal of the Highland, of the Highlanders, uh, meant that they should be treated better, if you like, mm -hmm. by politicians, by religious leaders, uh, and uh, I guess by, by, by writers and journalists as well. Uh, that they were deserving of, uh, uh, I guess, sort of special place uh, in Scotland and in uh, in Britain as a whole. Well, as far as creating a PR campaign, I think you did a fantastic job of. Oh yes, of finding beautiful. <laughs> yes, just real beauty of, of word and imagery to pull out. Um, you know, one thing that's that's been fun for me as I I read through these is is to see some older strains. So you mentioned Saint Columba, um, but in one of the prayers he that Alexander wrote down is very similar to the famous prayer of St. Patrick, you know, Christ above me, Christ below me, Christ behind me. Um, so we, we can see strands of, of Christianity or, or traditions going far back. Um, could you tell me a little bit about how threads of his work are going forward? Um, either how they've um, been adapted by people living today or how they're being put into practice by faith traditions. Um, what do you see as, as you're speaking on him and, and sharing his legacy? Uh, I think uh, from my perspective, what's important for me is, uh, if you like, showing that this tradition is worth studying in itself and also can tell us a huge amount uh, about, our, about Highland society today and the Highland Society of our grandparents, uh, how we are, if you like, in, you know, how we relate to the landscape, how we relate to the supernatural world around us. Uh, and, and also, I, I guess, I suppose, how, you know, we are both, uh, it's something which is very specific to the Highlands, the Carmen and Gadelica, is very much part of Highland society. And yet at the same time, if you like, it's part of a wider, uh, I guess it was Western European mainstream, you could call as well, in terms of the prayers and the blessings, and even to some extent, the healing charms as well. Uh, what we're seeing is a sort of Highland inflection, uh, you know, within a very specific circumstances and very specific situation of, uh, you know, a way of seeing the world and a way of engaging with uh, the supernatural, which would have been known to people across Europe and well beyond as well, 
several hundred years ago. So it's a sort of a lifeline, if you like, back through time to us as well. And I think it's it's very important for us to, um, to look at the people as well who gave Carmichael the material. Carmichael, uh, I mentioned John Francis Campbell, who was uh, one of Carmichael's earliest mentors. Now, John Francis Campbell, uh, when he was, he was collecting folklore, when he was writing down and getting other people to write down stories for him, he made very, very sure that the collectors, his collectors, would also record the name and the mm. age of the storyteller and where they lived and what their occupation was and where they might have got the stories as well. Now, we can look, um, and Carmichael followed this example all his life as well, and we can use uh, the census figures, we can use births, deaths and marriages records, which are all on online in Scotland today, and we can find out who these people actually were. We can trace out their biographies. Uh, we can we can get a feeling of of how they lived, what they knew, who they knew, and indeed who their descendants are in the islands today. And so, in a sense, you know, we're we're not just giving a voice to Carmichael, but we're also giving a voice to Carmichael's. Well, the, the word informants, the people that Carmichael spoke to and recorded from as well. And I think that's very, very important. You know, we're seeing, uh, we get a much more lively uh, and, uh, you know, complex picture, I think, <laughs> of Highland culture and, uh, and also Carmichael's own collecting practices when we are aware of and when we have researched these people's lives and indeed when we've talked to their descendants. Mm, which... Which brings me to one question I had listed to make sure I asked you. I know there's some controversy about his collection practices and, and whether mm. or not everything was verbatim. Um, but you are a resident <laughs> expert at the moment. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, Donald Meek in his book, The Quest for Celtic Christianity, has written about this at length, um, but much, much more eloquently than I'm able to do so at all. What we can see is that Carmichael saw himself as being like an archaeologist. He saw himself in the same way as an archaeologist might get um, shards of a pot and carefully fix them together to make the or try to make the original pot whole once more. Carmichael saw himself as doing this with the many charms and blessings and prayers which he had collected himself. He would have collected, well we know he collected different versions. We know that he thought that many of these versions were not necessarily whole. What Carmichael did with the help of his family and his friends was to try to reconstruct these um, holy texts, if you like, to try to approximate them to what they would have been like in Carmichael's view when they were first sung or first compiled. So we Undoubtedly, Carmichael was, he changed, if you like, some of the stuff which he had collected, because the words written on the bare paper couldn't approximate to this sort of feeling of sanctity and holiness and mystery, which he got when he heard this material, these, these runes being recited by the original reciters. On the bare page, they, they, you know, they looked bare. They, they, didn't, they, they didn't give it the, 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 the feeling. They didn't impart the sanctity and the holiness which Carmichael felt. So what he was trying to give in, in, in Carmina Gadelica, not just through the text, but also the way that they were printed, uh, you know, in a sort of bare white page with a beautiful initial uh, beginning them as well. He, he was trying to give his readers something of the feeling which he had himself when he listened to these uh, these prayers and blessings uh, being recited to him by aged men and women 
often or maybe certainly sometimes in conditions of secrecy uh, all these years ago in the Hebrides. Some of the material is more reworked than others, I think. The longer, I suspect, the longer uh, uh, a charm is, the more likely it is for some, at least, of Carmichael's own words to be in there as well. But I think it's very important when we look at what Carmichael was doing. First of all, we have to say, well, Carmichael was a product of his times. He was writing, he was composing Carmina Gadelica with his family and friends uh, at a specific moment in time for a specific reason. And that reason was a good reason. That was he was trying to uh, raise the profile of what had been a rather despised group of people living in the wild northwest of, the, of Scotland. Uh, and he was trying to to prove to his readers that, uh, that you know they were spiritual, that they were uh, they they were civilized, uh, and not only that, but they had a civilization dating back centuries. Uh, but also, he was following the same scholarly methodology that other scholars used for reconstructing songs during the same period. That is, they would have collect variants of songs and they would try to make the song as long as possible and they would try to fix the song if they thought that there were parts of the song which were missing or had, uh, you know, weren't necessarily being sung properly or whatever, you know, they would try to repair these, uh, these uh, gaps and problems in the text. Carmichael was trying to do the same thing with the blessings and prayers and charms. Now, the important thing, the, the final important thing I'd say about this is that Carmichael did not destroy his field notes. He could have destroyed his field notes, and so we would never have been able to work out what were the originals, uh, what you know, how, how much the material had been revised. But he kept his field notes. We found his field notes, or field notebooks, we should say. And because of that, we can compare what Carmichael originally recorded with what Carmichael printed in Carmina Gadelica. And we can see that in most cases, I'd say, the, there is a fairly good uh, mapping between the original and the, uh, the printed version. But there are some versions where Carmichael has let his enthusiasm run away with himself. <laughs> and he has, for the best of reasons, he's gone and added, and as he would say, maybe improved, or maybe he'd have thought about it as restored uh, the original version. Mm. Where, where and when did his field notebooks, um, where were they discovered? Oh, well, if I, we found them. They were, uh, the, the, the problem was that people were looking for field notes. So they were looking in the collection, which is many, many thousands of papers, books and files. Um, they were looking for uh, stray scraps of paper on which you'd have scribbled stuff down. Now, the thing is, you, you know, if you think about it for you know, for any length of time, you realise that if you're travelling around the Hebrides in the 1860s and 1870s, you're not going to travel around with just scraps of paper because the paper is going to get wet, it's going to get bedraggled, it's going to be impossible to write on, uh, you know, especially if you're trying to record in the sort of the, 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 the houses that people where people lived at that time, which didn't, they didn't have any tables or anything like that, you'd be writing on your knee. Uh, so what we should have been looking for were field notebooks, uh, notebooks which are robust, which are waterproof, uh, you know, which you can write on, on your knee. Uh, that's what Carmichael was recording in. So, uh, you know, we looked and we found them. 
uh, and there, you know, there's about oh, probably about 24, maybe 26 of them all told. And there's a few transcription notebooks as well. And uh, myself and other members of the team that were working with me uh, at Edinburgh University Special Collections for a good few years, we managed to transcribe oh, good part, about half a million words or so. That's an awful lot of words in Carmichael's field notebooks. Gracious. And uh, it took a lot of work. And uh, it has to be said, you know, I look at the transcriptions now and, uh, you know, I can see there's still quite a bit of stuff that we didn't necessarily understand at the time, uh, but we do understand nowadays. Uh, so it's, it's an ongoing process. The, his handwriting is bad, as I've said. Uh, it's written at speed. He often uses idiosyncratic syncratic abbreviations. He might leap from English to Gaelic to English to Gaelic in the space of one sentence. Um, it's quite a challenge to understand, uh, but it can be done. But it's almost psychological. You know, if you look at it and you think, well, you know, Carmichael wrote this down. It must have meant something to him. Therefore, it could mean something to me if I look at it long enough and hard enough. Uh, and it, eventually it does make sense. You get used to his, his handwriting. You get used to the way that his mind works as well. Uh, that in itself is, uh, is quite a challenge. And uh, because of that, it becomes easier and easier to transcribe and to make sense of what he recorded. And very occasionally, you can also uh, actually understand what he wrote down and uh, material which he himself could not understand late in life. <laughs> but <laughs> we can look at it and uh, we can work out what, uh, what Carmichael was on about. I know that Brits are not usually fond of personal questions, but you must feel like you're quite close to him now. Do you, is he almost as a, a friend? Yeah, it's it's a good. That's another good question. I mean, I mean, you know, Car Carmichael is uh, like you say, he can be quite a controversial figure, uh, but I think that we can forgive him, uh, or certainly I do personally, a lot of uh, the, the 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 things which he did in Carmen and Gadelica. He did it for the best of reasons, and also he was uh, he was following the the. Um, scholarly methodology of his day uh, in many ways. I don't think that we can we can be too hard on him for that. Uh, in terms of being a friend, I, I understand Carmichael a lot better because I, I spent a lot of time in Lismore when I was, uh, you know, younger. Uh, I haven't been there for a few years. I haven't been there since the pandemic began. Uh, I should definitely go back. But I, I you know, I, I got to know some of the older people in the island, uh, I learned a lot from them uh, and, and some of the, the, the younger people that have moved into the island as well, who are interested in the history and culture of the, of the island. Uh, I've learned a lot from them. And knowing, you know, the, 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 the place of Carmichael's boyhood and indeed the, the, the places where Carmichael worked, you know, in, in Isla, in Skye, in Uist, in Barra and the Outer Hebrides as well, it means that you get closer to the man himself. And also, of course, you're spending so much time trying to cipher his handwriting and also looking not just at his handwriting, his text, but on this and another podcast talking about his material culture collection, that is the things which Carmichael collected, which is now in uh, the West Highland Museum in Fort William. They've got a big uh, Alexander Carmichael collection there, ranging from silver brooches to charms to uh, healing threads to uh, tartan, which he collected, uh, Prince Charlie's stool uh, from South Uist. <laughs> it's all in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the collection there in the West Highland Museum. And we spent the team spent uh, several years looking at Carmichael's collection as well. Again, that's a privilege handling material that Carmichael had collected himself and he kept uh, all his life. Uh, so, yeah, you, you do inevitably feel uh, a certain closeness to the man and a certain protectiveness towards him as well. Yeah, I would suspect so. And I'm glad to hear that. He, the more I learn about him, the more I like him. Um, and I, I think it says a lot that he, about his character, that he was so well trusted by the people he was interviewing. Um, he, was a, he was a lovely man and people, people went up, people got on with him. 
uh, and he, he clearly, uh, you know, he sacrificed an awful lot. He was, he, I should say, he was a very good exciseman and he could easily have made, a, a, you know, a good career and a good living out of his profession. But he chose to sacrifice that. He sacrificed time. He sacrificed his money. He sacrificed his health in many ways as well uh, through and for this, uh, this ideal uh, and for his work as a, as a collector. Uh, so we're, we're hugely in debt to him. And I think that, uh, you know, what myself and other people on the Carmichael team did was that we, if you like, we opened up the black box of Alexander Carmichael because people weren't aware of his, his life in detail. Uh, people were, in many ways, they were a bit suspicious of his, his material because he, he had this controversial uh, side to him. And we've been able to, uh, to open this up to other people. Uh, we've been able to uh, talk about him to uh, communities uh, across the highlands and beyond. Uh, and, well, you know, we put out blogs. We've uh, got uh, all his material online. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, I, th I think... Uh, for me, I think that's really important. I think that it's just that, that privilege of being able to be, to have engaged at very close quarters with one man's collection and one man's life and also the lives of his informants and his circle. Uh, that, that's quite a precious thing and it's, it's also quite a, quite a, a, a duty uh, as well. And uh, I hope that uh, we we all in the team have uh, have been able to discharge our duty properly, and mm. uh, to make Carmichael a, a better known person and a more appreciated person as well, uh, to restore him and his wife uh, and his family uh, to uh, you know to a position of some renown which they deserve, both in literature uh, and in folklore and indeed in art and Celtic art as well. Mm. Mm. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, and that, that takes me to my second to last question. I know that okay. Alexander died just before the outbreak of World War I. And I, I think his wife, she must have died. She died, she but died, oh, no, I've forgotten. 1928, she died. She was okay. a formidable, she was a formidable lady. She took, uh, I think, three years off her life. You know, we actually, we were looking for her in the census returns for a very long time under the year that she said she'd been born. In. <laughs> and eventually we found out that she had been born, uh, I think, three years previously. Uh, <laughs> uh, she, had, she had made that up. Uh, her, her, uh, she, was, uh, she was older than she, she let on. Uh, and she, she had a very difficult life. She had a very difficult life when she was younger. Her uh, mother died of typhoid in Dundee. Um, her father absconded to Australia, where he died in the 1870s, uh, leaving her as effectively an orphan. And uh, she was brought up, uh, you know, and quite as, as a servant, basically, uh, for many, many years. Uh, so she was, uh, you know, in, in a sense, she was a bit like Carmichael. She had a difficult childhood. Uh, and... Uh, you know, there's a certain amount of sort of radicalness uh, about her as well as a result of this. Uh, but no, she lived, uh, she lived for, for longer. I, I should say also that uh, until 1928, uh, Carmichael in his uh, letters would complain about how hard she worked herself. Uh, she, she, never, she never relaxed, I think. She, she was quite a formidable figure when you see pictures of her. Uh, and her daughter, or their daughter, Ella Carmichael, married William J. Watson, who was professor of Celtic at Edinburgh University. And it was through William Watson, uh, Carmichael's son-in-law, that Carmichael's uh, collection finally arrived in the University of Edinburgh on Watson's death in 1948. Uh, so there, there are some uh, descendants of Carmichael still alive. Uh, I'm very lucky to have uh, met met one uh, a, a good friend, uh, and it's it's really interesting to see how the the, the family how they feel about Alexander Carmichael, and uh, we're very much in in their debt as well for all the help that they've given us. Mm. Thank you. That's interesting. I didn't know if he had living descendants. So really fascinating.
I'll have to add them to a future podcast. That would be neat. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, my last question for you, maybe the most important one. Um, I think a, a lot of the people that will be receiving this article that I send out in our Clan Carmichael newsletter next in August, will be learning about Alexander in the Carmina Gadelica for the first time. Um, and if people are interested in learning more about him or about Scottish Gaelic culture and tradition, which direction would you point them in? Where should they start? Oh, goodness me. Uh, I'd have a look at Carma, Carmina Gadelica itself. Uh, two volumes published during Carmichael's lifetime in 1900. Uh, then there were four later volumes published. The final one was published in 1970, drawing upon other material in Carmichael's collection, uh, stuff which he had edited for printing, but uh, he never actually got around to printing himself songs uh, and, uh, you know, other, other charms and incantations, and indeed an entire list, a fascinating list of uh, unusual Gallic words uh, as well. They're real treasure trove material. So start with Carmen Agadelica. Um, there are three volumes which you can get online, uh, Carmen Agadelica 1, 2 and 3, and these uh, give you a, a wonderful picture of the man himself, of the material he was collecting and also what he made of it and this sort of great artistic achievement of Carmen Agadelica. It's beautifully written and it's full of fascinating nuggets of information uh, about the literature and customs and beliefs of the people of the Highlands. Uh, I'd always recommend Donald Meek's book, uh, The Quest for Celtic Christianity, that I've mentioned twice already. Uh, I think it's a, it's a lovely book. And again, it's, it's very, it's very easy, easy to read. Uh, and it's uh, you know, written by a, a wonderful scholar. Uh, I suppose that I should I should flag up the collection which I did called the Life and Legacy of Alexander Carmichael, uh, a whole load of scholars uh, writing uh, about Alexander Carmichael, his life, his achievements. Um, that was put out in two thousand and eight by the Islands Book Trust in the island of Lewis. Uh, so I edited that but I, I really should I really should write more about Alexander Carmichael I've written various articles about him but uh, as, as my wife always tells me uh, it really is high time that I should write the biography of Alexander Carmichael and indeed uh, give uh, uh, paying homage as well to his family and his friends in his circle and also his many informants as well. The Carmen Agadelica is, if you like, a sort of a group achievement uh, of many, many different people. Uh, and if ever I were to write the, the sort of biography of Carmichael, which I really should, uh, that would be, it would be a picture of island society and indeed the diaspora Highland society in Edinburgh during the late 1800s. I agree with your wife. She sounds like a very wise woman. And you could almost follow it up with a biography just on his daughter as well. She um, seems like she was quite a person in her own right. He is uh, both uh, the, the daughter, Ella Carmichael, and Mary Frances Carmichael, uh, Carmichael's wife, were extremely important figures in their own right in Gallic literature and in the wider Celtic revival. Uh, Ella Carmichael was very beautiful. And uh, she turned a lot of hearts uh, <laughs> when she was younger, before she married. Uh, and she did some amazing collecting work uh, herself. She's a very, very interesting figure. And you will be pleased to hear that, uh, that there are uh, other scholars working uh, on, on, uh, on uh, among, among others, on uh, the Carmichael women as well. Priscilla Scott has done an amazing PhD uh, on women in the Scottish Gaelic Celtic revival. And I hope that a book will be coming out from her soon. Lovely. I will make a note to myself to reach out to Priscilla because I'd love to hear about that as well. Um, and for now, I shouldn't take a single moment more of your time because I know it's quite late, never mind where the sun might be. Um, <laughs> but I'm so grateful, Professor. Thank you so much. This has been, I know it'll be helpful for my readers, but for me personally, it's been very fascinating and also very encouraging. And I can't wait to get more into uh, the Carmina Gadelica and see what I discover there. 
Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Thanks again to Dr. Donald William Stewart for taking the time to talk with Leah about Alexander Carmichael, someone who has made great contributions to history, but is also sometimes unknown, even to us Carmichaels. If you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to the podcast and share it with fellow Carmichaels or anyone else that you think might enjoy these shows. You can subscribe on iTunes or Spotify, and the show can also be found at the Clan Carmichael USA website. If you like what we're doing here, or even if you don't, leave us a review. Your five-star reviews help to promote the show and make it easier for others to find us. Again, visit the website at www.clancarmichaelusa.com to learn more about membership. And next time you're on Amazon, make sure you select Clan Carmichael USA as your nonprofit of choice and start making donations now. Until next time, to your prey. See you soon.